All right. The, again, you have the uh, description uh, for Rob in your folder. I encourage you to read that. He has spoken for us before. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, to visit with um, Dr. Balza at WLC where he uh, gave me a whole demonstration, showed me all the things that they were doing in the lab. Uh, our acquaintance began on the topic of stem cell research and um, since then it's been an enduring friendship. So uh, I invite you to pay attention now to Dr. Balza. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? So yeah, so my name is Rob Balza and I'm gonna be uh, teaching, uh, talking today on the topic of stem cell biology. And so my plan uh, this afternoon is in recognition of the fact that not all of you are biology majors, like I'm used to teaching at the college. Uh, uh, I'm gonna start with just what are cells and then move on to what are stem cells and then talk about some of the more controversial forms of stem cells, ethically speaking, some of the challenges and also, while I'm not a futurist, uh, like our last speaker, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the direction this field's headed, uh, what you can expect to see uh, in the future, um, and some of the challenges we're going to face on the ethical side there. So um, biologists have uh, a few theories that they hold very near and dear to them. Um, for example, the germ theory of disease is one lots, lots of people are talking about right now in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but my personal favorite theory is cell theory. And cell theory is basically this, all living things on earth are made of cells, right? So if you take any plant outside and you slice it, take a thin slice of it, shave of it, put that under a microscope, um, you'll see something that looks like this. You'll see that it's made of you know, um, millions of cells, these tiny little membrane bound structures that contain genetic information and they can replicate, they can multiply, um, to repair damaged tissue, to grow new leaves, these sorts of things. If you take any animal, you'll see the same thing. So this is a piece of human skeletal muscle, and you take a piece of, the bi uh, of your biceps or something like that, take a thin slice of it, put it on a microscope, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see that your bicep muscle is made of cells. These are called skeletal muscle fibers because they're long hair-like cells, but they're cells. Your whole body's made of these cells. So these keratinocytes on the surface of your skin, if you zoomed in under a microscope, you'd see these little round pancake-shaped cells on the surface of your skin. If you zoomed into your brain, you'd find these neurons. These are the cells that allow you to think and process information and send information to different parts of your body to move around and stuff like this. If you zoomed into your liver, you'd see these little cells we call hepatocytes that are very important for metabolism. Anywhere you look in your body, you're made of cells, okay? Now, what stem cells are, are a particular type of cell. Um, stem cells are cells that have two kind of special powers that not all cells do. Right? So stem cells, number one, the first special power is that they can make more cells. Right? Um, and so for a lot of cells in our body, like our heart cells or like our brain cells, if you live to be 96 years old, a lot of your brain cells are 96 years old when you die. Right? A lot of your heart cells are 96 years old when you die. But other cells are constantly dying and being reborn. Right? So while there's 10 to 100 trillion cells in the typical human body, every couple minutes, you know, even seconds, millions of cells in your body are dying and being reborn. Right? So if we looked at your skin you know, um, today and two weeks from now, we would see all new skin cells on the surface of our skin. It's a wonderful blessing that we're constantly sloughing off skin and growing new skin to replace that. Um, unfortunately, that's what all the dust is in your house. <laughs> it's mostly human skin cells. There's a little disturbing uh, observation there. Um, same thing in your blood, right? Blood cells typically last a little bit longer, but every couple of months, your, your blood cells are being filtered out by organs like your spleen, and they're being replaced by new blood cells. Now, the cells in your body that are making new skin or making new blood, and other tissues like this, we call stem cells, again, because they have the special power of being able to produce new cells, replicating, and the other special power that they have is the ability to differentiate, which is a fancy word biologists use to, to mean specialize, right? So sort of like as we go up through the education system, we're unspecialized when we're in kindergarten, right? You know, we could become anything. We could become a professional basketball player. We could become a, you know, a microbiologist. We could become a nurse. Um, but as you move through the education system, you start to specialize more and more in a particular area. And it's very difficult to go back and kind of retrain. I don't think I could become a, uh, a PGA golfer now at this point, 
you know, I've shot under 100 once in my life. <laughs> Even though my dad's a golf coach and he's constantly trying to fix everything I do wrong, like, I don't think you'll ever get me to a PGA level, no matter how hard I dedicate it. Because the older you get, the more special you get in a particular area, it's hard to retrain. Cells are the same way, okay? So um, we also have the amazing ability now, and we've been able to do this for over 100 years as biologists, um, taking cells um, out of plants or out of animals, isolating them, putting them in petri dishes, giving them everything they need, and growing them outside of the body, right? So for example, this is a very famous type of human cell. This is a, it's called a HeLa cell. HeLa is a kind of abbreviation for Henrietta Lacks. That was the woman um, who these cells were derived from. So she had uh, cervical carcinoma, a type of cancer, and that tumor was biopsied, and a physician uh, decades ago took those cells and put them into a petri dish and fed them with all the sugar, all the amino acids, all the vitamins, everything those cells need to grow. And his astonishment, they continue to grow and fill up a petri dish. And so each one of these little circles you see here is an individual human cell. Um, turns out that cancer cells are special in some ways in that they're immortal. And what we mean by that is if I were to take some of my skin cells and put them in a petri dish, I'd be able to fill up a dish, split that into two dishes, and then into four dishes, and then into eight dishes, and I might even get in my incubator pretty filled with my own human skin cells. That's only a little bit creepy, right? Um, <laughs> and some biotech companies, by the way, grow human skin, right, for um, uh, patients that need help healing wounds or have been burnt or something like this. Um, there's certain biotech companies that specialize in that. But my skin cells will kind of peter out and they'll enter a state called senescence where they, over time, just don't divide anymore, right? And a lot of biologists believe that's why there's, there seems to be kind of a, a built-in limit to human lifespan, is our stem cells just stop dividing as we get older. And so we don't repair tissues uh, as well anymore. Um, you know, you hear stories about babies being operated on in utero for things like spina bifida, and they're born and you don't even see a scar from the surgery, right? Because they have such you know, amazing regenerative abilities. My kids fall off their skateboard and scrape up their knee, and two weeks later, no sign of it. I get a little paper cut, and I've got a lifelong scar now, <laughs> you know? Um, and it just takes so much longer to heal than it used to. Um, so uh, these are the power of stem cells, and this is the, this idea that stem cells, you know, slow down in terms of their ability to divide. Cancer cells are a little bit different in that they can, you know, continue to divide indefinitely. Again, so we use that word immortal to describe cells like that. And so these HeLa cells have spread all over the world. I use them in my laboratory. So I have little vials, little plastic vials of frozen liquid nitrogen in my laboratory that contain these HeLa cells. Again, that were derived decades ago. Um, you know, so George Guy, the physician that isolated these cells, isolated them, propagated them, froze them down, gave them to another scientist at Johns Hopkins who gave them to another scientist at the University of Wisconsin in Madison who gave them to another scientist at the Medical College of Wisconsin who gave them to me. Right? and thousands of other scientists around the world. Right? So if I want to study um, a virus, or if I want to study uh, I can inf that only affects human cells, I can study that virus using these cells. If I want to study um, there are certain bacteria that only grow and divide by infecting human cells. So one of my colleagues at Wisconsin Lutheran College, Dr. Jim Hinkle, he's a world's leading expert in chlamydia. He grows chlamydia inside these human cells, which is way creepier than anything I do. Uh, and I don't even like going to his lab. Um, but so these have been amazing resources, and much of the chemotherapeutic agents, um, you know, much of the strategies we have to treat cancer were developed by studying cells like this in petri dishes, a term we biologists say, we say it's in vitro, right? We study this, these cells. So you can take some, you know, some scuba diver goes down to some coral reef and pulls up a weird sponge that seems to have toxic effects in, in fish, and we take those, those molecules, we isolate them from the sponge, we put them on cancer cells, and we see if it stops the cancer cells from dividing. You know, that's largely how pharmaceutical companies discover new pharmaceuticals to this day. The vast majority of the U.S. pharmacopoeia is naturally derived products. Right? Um, and not only have, do we have the ability to culture human cells, but we've discovered ways to grow and utilize all kinds of cells that are in your body right now these so-called adult stem cells, right? And the most famous of these, and the one that we've studied and, and worked with the longest, are bone marrow stem cells. Um, 
the most powerful stem cell in your bone marrow, and this is the soft tissue inside your bones. If you've ever taken a bone from Kentucky Fried Chicken after you're done with your meal and kind of cracked that bone open, and you look inside and there's this soft tissue. Everyone thinks of bones as like being rocks and stuff, but they're very dynamic, growing, living things that are vascularized and have cells living inside of them. And the most interesting cell, in my opinion, in your bone marrow are called hematopoietic stem cells. And again, these fulfill the criteria for stem cells. They can make more of themselves, and they can specialize. They can turn to something more specialized. In this case, these hematopoietic stem cells, these bone marrow stem cells, can form all the cells of your blood. The erythrocytes, the red blood cells that transport oxygen, the leukocytes, the white blood cells that fight off disease and infection. All these cells can be derived from these very powerful hematopoietic stem cells. So in many cases, um, you've probably heard of individuals that have had bone marrow transplant. I wouldn't be surprised if there are people in here today that have benefited from bone marrow transplants. That's a widely employed strategy. Um, in some cases, it's helpful for cancer patients. So um, cancer patients can receive high-dose radiation chemotherapy to stop cancer cells from dividing. But unfortunately, that radiation chemotherapy can also stop your stem cells from dividing. Right? So your skin gets thinner, um, your hair falls out, Right? You become nauseous because the, the cells that line your gut aren't replicating as fast as they would, and you become anemic because your blood cells aren't forming as fast as they could otherwise. But you can get around this problem by transplanting bone marrow after high-dose radiation chemotherapy to reconstitute your blood supply, the stem cells that are providing you with new blood cells. It's saved countless lives in the past few decades. And, you know, beyond that, there's lots of other valuable um, adult stem cells found in the human body. For example, in your skin and underneath the surface of your skin, we find these mesenchymal or mesenchymal stem cells um, that can form uh, very useful tissues for wound, treating wounds, right? In baby teeth, so when my kids have a tooth that falls out, they typically stick it under the pillow and the tooth fairy leaves them a buck or something, or a piece of candy, which is kind of ironic. Here, right out your new teeth. Uh, it, you know, but it turns out these teeth are far more valuable than the dollar the tooth fairy left them. They have very valuable stem cells in them. And in some laboratories, we've managed to regrow teeth, human teeth, using stem cells found in deciduous baby teeth, uh, which is pretty amazing and gives a lot of um, dentists hope that someday, rather than 3D printing or carving a replacement teeth, we might be able to grow new ones, which would be a pretty cool thing, I think. Um, umbilical cord blood. Uh, this is a resource that's often, you know, thrown away in the delivery room, right? After birth, the placenta and the umbilical cord are simply thrown in the biohazard bin. But we now recognize that um, the umbilical cord has a rich supply of stem cells, including the mesenchymal stem cells that make connective tissue and the hematopoietic stem cells that can make blood and things like this. And, you know, for a small fee, you can store your baby's umbilical cord stem cells. So my last child was born about six years ago, and we had that opportunity if we wanted to freeze down some of those cells in liquid nitrogen in case they were ever needed uh, to treat some form of disease. We've now found in, in human fat, there are interesting stem cells that can be used to repair tendons or bones or things like this. Um, and uh, I'm really interested in companies that are developing things like this because, right, that's a company that's going to be successful. They can take out your fat and then make you healthier. <laughs> I have a feeling that's going to sell pretty well in, in, the, in the U.S. market. Uh, speaking of selling well, this, is, this might sound, might sound like a big deal to some of you, uh, but, you know, treating baldness with stem cells, I'm telling you that's a billion dollar business plus in the United States. There are stem cells in breast milk that we just started to recognize in the past few years and understand. There are incredible stem cells in the liver that can fill, facilitate amazing liver regeneration and can be used to treat a wide range of congenital um, defects uh, associated with different um, liver diseases and things. Uh, amazing adult stem cells. And these are incredible treatments, and they're not very controversial, uh, you know, to a large extent. Um, I don't, I've never met anyone that, for example, has many ethical concerns associated with bone marrow transplantation. And they see it as a wonderful gift of God, um, as do I. Um, but there are some forms of stem cell therapies um, that are being explored in clinical trials and in laboratories around the world um, that I'm very concerned about uh, in terms of the ethics. And I want to talk to you guys about those a little bit as well. And some of those stem cell therapies are based on a technology that has also benefited people in a lot of different ways. Um, this technology of in vitro fertilization, 
um, IVF. And so this was first done um, with humans in 1978. And it was really invented by this gentleman, Robert Edwards, who eventually won the Nobel Prize for this technology. And the idea is this, and you probably know uh, couples that um, uh, you know, were unable to conceive of children naturally. And there's a wide range of reasons for that. And sometimes it's on the paternal side. There's defects in the sperm. Um, oftentimes it's on the maternal side, right? There might be a blockage in the fallopian tube or an ovulatory dysfunction or something like that. In vitro fertilization is a way to isolate eggs from the mother and isolate sperm from the father, combine them in a petri dish, and then transfer them directly to the uterus, transfer those embryos directly to the uterus. And it's been an incredibly successful way to bypass a wide range of infertility problems that couples experience. Um, the latest estimates I've seen um, in the United States, tens of thousands of babies are born each year through this technology now. Uh, in fact, it's getting close to 2% of the babies born in the United States each year use some form of vitro fertilization technology. Um, now, one of the interesting things and kind of concerning things to me about in vitro fertilization technology is that during this process, oftentimes more embryos are produced in vitro than are actually transferred to the mother. And so sometimes these so-called leftover embryos are then frozen down in liquid nitrogen, just like the HeLa cells that are frozen down in my laboratory. And they can be then thawed out at a later date and transferred to the mother somewhere down the line. But sometimes the father and the mother die in a car accident before those embryos are able to be transferred. And so we have orphaned embryos. Sometimes the father and the mother can see these, um, these embryos get a divorce and they decide they no longer want them. Um, I saw on the agenda later on that, um, is it Leah? It's gonna be talking a little bit about embryo adoption. I'm looking forward to that talk. That should be very interesting. Um, and I, um, I've got family members that are uh, going through embryo adoption processes right now. It's a very interesting um, way to kind of, but this situation in the United States, it's largely unregulated. There's very little legislation that oversees this kind of a wild west of modern biotechnology that oversees how these embryos can be created and, and what's done with them. Um, the sad fact is today, human embryos conceived by the vitro fertilization process are sometimes just thrown away because they're no longer wanted by the couples um, that paid to have them generated through this technology. And so what some scientists have said is these embryos might have the potential to form stem cells that can be used to treat more diseases than these adult stem cells I just talked about have the power to um, form. And, and, here, and here's why. Um, oh, I forgot about this slide. I want to make you aware that not any, everyone views embryos in the same way um, I do, and pro I'm guessing most of you do as well, um, seeing them as a nascent form of human life. Um, many physicians and um, biotechnologists don't even use the term embryos to describe what I'm talking about. Right? When you take a human egg and you fertilize, fertilize it with sperm in vitro and it starts, the cells start dividing um, to form an early stage embryo, um, I just want to make you aware that many physicians will use the term um, pre-embryo to describe uh, these, these human embryos in petri dishes. And the reason they use that term is not because it's something different. I mean, they're, they're trying to alleviate ethical concerns you may have about the moral status of these human embryos. Um, so it's a very interesting political kind of movement to kind of rename something just so people aren't so concerned about the ethics of this technology. And I just want you to make, make you aware of that, that that's happening out there. Now, another Nobel Prize winning discovery um, is, and, and this dates back all the way to 1981 um, by two scientists, Martin Evans and, and, Ka and Dr. Kaufman. What they discovered using mice is that if you take a very early mouse embryo, you do in vitro fertilization with my, mice, you take a mouse egg and you fertilize it with a mouse sperm, and you make this embryo, um, I'm gonna to refer to it as an embryo, not a pre-embryo, because that's what I believe it is, and it starts dividing into cells, and the next cell stage of embryo we call a morula, because it looks like a little mulberry, um, or, or, or a, a raspberry, kind of under the microscope, it's from the same Latin root, um, and then it kind of hollows out and forms what's called a blastocyst, okay? Now it's at this stage that typically the embryo is finally entering its, pa exiting its passage through the fallopian tubes of the mother and entering the uterus for the first time, about, in humans about three days after fertilization, we're on this stage, and this is the point at which that embryo then finally implants in the uterus, starts to form a placenta, 
And then these embryos, these cells inside the embryo here, we call the inner cell mass, those are the cells that actually form the embryo itself. These cells around the outside are what form the placenta and a lot of the supporting tissues and things. Well, what Evans and Coffin demonstrated is that if you take these cells out of the mouse embryo, you can place them in a petri dish and you can grow them indefinitely just like you can human cancer cells. They have an immortal state to them. Right? Now, that's different than any of the adult stem cells we were talking about before. The hematopoietic stem cells in your bone marrow, you can't grow them indefinitely. Every time someone needs a, a bone marrow transplant, you have to find a bone marrow donor you know, to give them those cells because we can't grow them indefinitely in a petri dish. Um, these cells are different in that once you isolate them, you really have an unlimited supply of them. And the other thing is that um, what they, they discovered is that these cells have an important property called pluripotency. And what that means is that these so-called embryonic stem cells can form not only blood, not only skin, not only connective tissue to repair tendons and bones, they can form every cell in the human body. So for any disease that's degenerative in nature, and by the way, that's the majority of diseases that kill humans, right? So for example, the leading cause of death in the, industrial, in the United States, you know, even during a pandemic, um, is not COVID right now, it's heart disease, right? And what that is, is cells of the heart dying and not being replaced and leading to heart failure. Um, diseases like Alzheimer's or neurons not being replaced and proliferating. Um, with these cells, you can grow in petri dishes neurons. You can grow heart muscle cells, and you have a limited supply of them. This is what got biologists really, really excited, and this, why, this is why the Nobel Prize was awarded for this technology, this so-called um, embryonic stem cell technology. And so just to summarize um, kind of where we are, most of the cells in your adult body, uh, we say are terminally differentiated, meaning they're so specialized they can't do anything else. So for example, a cardiomyocyte in your heart, that's all that cell can ever do is be a heart cell. That's a very important cell. It's beating and helping to squeeze the blood in your heart and push blood all, th all throughout your body. But that's all that cell can do. If you take cardiomyocytes out of someone's heart, you put them in a petri dish, that cell will sit there and it'll beat, but it can never do anything else. Right? It can only be a heart cell. It's terminally differentiated. The majority of cells in your body are like that. But some cells in your body are multipotent. So for example, I mentioned the hematopoietic stem cells in your bone marrow. These cells can turn into a wide range of blood cells. They can turn into red blood cells and white blood cells, you know, neutrophils, macrophages, all these different very interesting cells. They're, they can form multiple cell types. They're multipotent. But embryonic stem cells, while they can't form a whole new embryo, they're not totipotent. They can't, you can't just implant them into a uterus and form a baby. They can form every cell in the human body, and so we give them this name pluripotent. No adult stem cell, nothing from your bone marrow, nothing from the umbilical cord has ever been shown to have the same sort of potency, and no adult cell has ever been shown to be immortal, all right, to be able to propagate indefinitely basically start factories making different cells, things like that. Okay? Now, once this technology was really uh, adapted to humans, and basically what happened is in the light, late 90s, early 2000s, people realized these embryonic stem cells from mice are amazing, Nobel Prize winning technology. We have human embryos from vitro fertilization clinics that are being thrown in the garbage at the same time, some biologists said, wait a minute, maybe we can put these two things together. Why don't we take these human embryos that are being thrown away, derive human embryonic stem cells that we can use for research and potential therapies down the road? And that happened for the first time in 1998. Um, and you can remember, uh, I'm sure, there was article, front, you know, front page articles in every newspaper and every magazine across the country talking about this new embryonic stem cell technology. And there were scientists that were quickly taking these new human embryonic stem cells and using them to try out new therapies. So for example, probably the most famous in the early days of this technology um, was this professor from UC Irvine, Hans Kirstead. And what he demonstrated is that you could take these human embryonic stem cells and you can make a very special cell type called oligodendrocytes. These are the cells that in your spinal cord kind of wrap around to protect the neurons. And 
what we know is that when you have a spinal cord injury, it's these cells that die, and then the neurons die later on. That's why oftentimes you get a spinal cord injury, you actually get this progressive loss of use over time, loss of sensation over time. It's because the oligodendrocytes die first, and then the neurons die later. This is especially true in contusive spinal cord injuries when there's kind of blunt force trauma rather than something that cuts the spinal cord. And Dr. Pierce had set up his laboratory devices that would deliver these contusive spinal cord injuries to rodents. And what he showed is that in a normal rodent, when you get, deliver this contusive spinal cord injury, you would see these rodents that um, had lesions in their spinal cord that result in paralysis of the lower limbs. And he could do this very, very repeatedly. And then what he showed in his laboratory is that if you take mice with that spinal cord injury and you inject in oligodendrocytes into the site of the injury that were derived from human embryonic stem cells, you could, and these mice aren't perfect, they're not walking like they did before the injury, but they can regain a significant amount of use of the lower limbs. And this generated a lot of excitement in the scientific community um, and a wide range of other laboratories around the world started doing similar experiments. Um, so, for example, the laboratory at the Medical College of Wisconsin, where I was trained, started looking at these types of cells to treat heart disease. Can you form heart muscle cells and inject them to someone that had a heart attack to help repair heart muscle that otherwise would have just been, uh, become scar tissue? And you saw similar results in mice when you injected in cardiomyocytes derived from embryonic stem cells. Again, so lots of these de degenerative diseases that we have no treatment for, we saw a great deal of potential. Okay? But people started asking the question, the ethical questions that at this time, right? On one hand, right, this could be the greatest medical technology, right, since antibiotics in the 1940s. On the other hand, some viewed this as a form of high-tech cannibalism, right? Killing one human, these embryos in the petri dish, to help treat other humans. And there started to be quite a bit of a debate um, in the early 2000s about this technology political debates. Now, you might remember politicians, like, up in debate stages talking about embryonic stem cells. What should we do? Should we fund this research? Should we not? And my observation of this is that people kind of fell into two camps, two philosophical camps. Now, I don't have formal training in philosophy, but my understanding is that um, some people took what's called the utilitarian approach um, to dealing with embryonic stem cells. And basically, this, this argument goes this way. Right? You've got one human embryo in a petri dish that can use to derive a line of embryonic stem cells. That line of embryonic stem cells could perhaps then be used to treat thousands or even millions of individuals with different diseases because those cells are immortal. Right? Once you derive them, you never run, run out of that resource. It's an amazing resource. So the utilitarian argument for the use of embryonic stem cells was many more people can benefit than might be harmed you know, as the embryo in the petri dish, right? So the utilitarian argument is do what's best for the most people. The good of the many outweighs the good of the few, right? On the other hand, there's philosophical approaches, you know, uh, first probably articulate, articulated by Immanuel Kant, who was actually uh, a Lutheran philosopher, interestingly enough. Um, and Immanuel Kant developed a different philosophical strategy that he termed the categorical imperative. And basically, the strategy is act morally regardless of the consequence, right? Do what is right in all situations. And this philosophical debate actually becomes real when you put it in these contexts, right? So um, we have um, cars that are autonomous, they're self-driving now. You have to program into those cars to make decisions like this. If suddenly, right, um, you know, you see a, a bunch of people in front of the car and you hit some ice, should the car be programmed to swerve and kill someone else to avoid killing multiple people? And these are philosophical problems that they call like the trolley problem, right? So you're this person here, this trolley is headed towards these five people. Um, what's the moral thing to do? Flip the switch, divert them to kill this person instead? Or don't do anything and let it kill the five people, right? It turns out when philosophers ask people this question, the vast majority say, flip the switch. Right? The vast majority take a utilitarian approach to this. Um, and only a small minority will say, you know, you're killing this, you're making a decision to kill this person by flipping the switch, you shouldn't do that. So the majority take a utilitarian approach. But it's interesting, if you frame this question in different ways, you get different answers. For example, on the trolley problem, there's another problem called the fat man problem. Yeah. This, this philosophical approach was developed in the 60s before they were politically correct, so. <laughs> 
uh, I don't think we get away with this as academics anymore talking about the fat man problem. But um, the, 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 the question is framed a little different. You still have a trolley headed towards five people. Should you push this fat man onto the track to stop the trolley from killing these five people? Right? In some ways, it's the same sort of utilitarian calculus, right? Five versus one. But in this case, you actually have to take the act of pushing this person. Right? And it turns out the vast majority of people won't do this, but will do this. Right? So it's interesting. And philosophers now and, and psychologists have developed kind of this um, embedded reasoning for how to ration through this stuff and how humans take this. And they developed some kind of rules, this universal moral grammar. And what they found is that you know, humans, you know, uh, action is worse than omission. Means is worse than the side effects. Contact is worse than non-contact. And this is universal regardless of religion. And so what you'll hear psychologists say is, these discoveries suggest that all humans, regardless of religion, are endowed with a gift from nature, a biological code for living a moral life. This code is a universal moral grammar providing us with an unconscious suite of principles for judging what is morally right and wrong. The person that wrote this is an atheist. But to me, this sounds a lot like the Apostle Paul. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they are shown that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. I think this is a conscience. Like We have a universal morality built into us, and I think this is evidence of God. Right? And when I'm talking to students about things like embryonic stem cell technology, very, very complex and difficult moral questions arise. But in my experience, the students are usually like instinctively squeamish about taking a human embryo, right? And even if they're the most utilitarian person you've ever met, they realize there's something not quite right about taking a human embryo and destroying it to generate these embryonic stem cells. And you know, even the biologists that did this kind of work recognize this. Right? So this is Dr. James Thompson, professor of biology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He was the first one to derive human embryonic stem cells. And he said very early in this, in this whole debate, this makes me uncomfortable. And I met him personally, and he's told, told me that basically up front. Like, I did this research, but I, I still struggle with the ethics of this. And other biologists motivated um, and this is uh, Dr. Shinya Yamanaka, Nobel Prize winner for a new type of stem cell technology that I want to talk to you about just for a minute or two. This is called induced pluripotent stem cell technology. And what he discovered, and this is motivated by the same kind of built-in moral compass that these embryos, right? He looked at the petri dish at, at human embryos and he says, my daughter, you know, was an embryo just like this, right? This is something different than those cancer cells we grow in petri dishes. This, is, this human embryo has something like a moral status that we need to be more careful about. And so even biologists that are not Christians, like Dr. Yamanaka, looked at this and said, we need to find an alternative approach. And so what Dr. Yamanaka did is he discovered an amazing way to turn skin cells into pluripotent stem cells. And basically what this technology involves is inserting genes that are usually only expressed in the human embryo, and it kind of turns back the clock on cells. It takes an old guy like me and turns him into a kindergartner again, right? This is called induced pluripotent stem cell technology. It's a way to derive the benefits of pluripotent stem cells without destroying human embryos. And it's an amazing gift. Um, this won the Nobel Prize a few years ago for this technology. And now, if you look, sorry, I just noticed I'm running out of time, so I'm skipping a few slides, I'm sorry. If you look, uh, you do a survey of the human clinical trials in stem cells, in pluripotent stem cells. The ones in blue uh, are ongoing trials using embryonic stem cells. Uh, the ones in orange are now the trials that are ongoing using induced pluripotent stem cells. And you can really see the field shifting in this direction. And I believe this sort of technology would not have been, mo would not have been accomplished had it not been for the concerns of organizations like CLR it's done a lot of work on the ethics of this in the early days, and I'm very thankful for the leadership position that folks like uh, Pastor Fleischman took in this regard, and the papers that were written and stuff on this, um, organizing um, Christian groups um, to say, look, we need an alternative approach, right? And so funding has shift, shifted, and the field has shifted, 
And there's amazing therapies in the clinic using uh, induced pluripotent stem cell technology, non-embryo destructive stem cell technology to treat things like heart disease, all right? um, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, spinal cord injury, macular degeneration, um, lots of amazing stuff happening. And what my, um, my advisor told me in graduate school, he said, Rob, um, science always under delivers and underperforms in the short run, but it always over delivers in the long run. And I think that's what we're going to see here with this field of stem cell technology, especially now that we've overcome a lot of these ethical challenges. Um, in closing, I just want to kind of give a call to action a little bit. Right? Um, I've had um, atheist scientist friends who, when I express concerns about human embryonic stem cell technology, they'll say things like, I understand you have concerns about this, Rob, but when are you Christians going to stop just being obstructive and contribute to moving this field forward? Um, and I'm proud to have played a role in some of this induced pluripotent stem cell technologies. And um, I, I just want to say that, think about that. It's just as important as standing up and saying, I have concerns about embryonic stem cell technology. Um, just as important as that is saying, is supporting the alternatives, right? And the same thing like the talk we heard this morning from Tabitha, you know, um, it, she was talking about how just as important as, you know, opposing abortion is helping to support alternatives of that. I believe she's 100% right about that, and I feel the same way about stem cell technology. And just a reminder from Luther that all the work in the city, in the field, in the home, um, these are masks of our Lord God behind which he wants to be hidden to all things. So even someone that's non-Christian, like Dr. Yamanaka, God can work through him to provide moral means, to provide, you know, divide providence and sustenance through these technologies in ethical ways. Thank you very much for, for listening this morning. I um, hope that helped you understand what's going on in this field a little bit better, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have later on about this. Thank you, Rob. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a two-minute break. <laughs> we'll take a two-minute break, and we'll get back on track. It's all right. The... Um, but thank you very much, Rob. It's uh, living with, with doing, not just telling people what not to do, but supporting what's done that's done right. You know, alternatives, and that's what I like about Rob's presentation. Okay, take two minutes, and we'll begin here with the next one in a couple minutes.
give it a try. Is that better? Is that quite a bit better? Not much better? How is it right now? Good? Thank you very much. Okay, if we could have you take your seats, please. We're just about ready to begin.